And I can only do one thing at a time, talk or operate the computer. So I apologize mm -hmm. for that. Fine, fine, fine. Pauses. Um, but it is my pleasure tonight to introduce everyone to Tracy Featherstone, um, who is our artist, uh, having the first exhibit in the Castaker Gallery at Ripon College this semester. And I first have to thank the Castaker Fund for um, supporting all of our shows this year. Tracy is a professor at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. She has a BFA from the University of Cincinnati and an MFA from the University of Arizona. She's gotten grants from the Ohio Arts Council. She's done residencies um, in the Czech Republic sponsored by the US embassies. She's exhibited nationally and internationally and she's taught nationally and internationally. Um, she's had recent group exhibitions um, at the Carnegie in Kentucky, at the MoMA in New York City. And Tracy, I think I first saw your work um, either in the UN Museum at the Contemporary Art Center um, or possibly at the Weston Gallery in Cincinnati. And that mm -hmm. would have been, you know, a few, a few years at least before, um, before I met you. And okay. One thing that I have always loved um, about your work is how quirky and playful and fun it appears. And I know we were talking um, this week and as we, um, or as I started to install the show, and the work that we have at Ripon College is pretty new, pretty new work. It's pretty fresh. There's some work from mm -hmm from 2020 mm -hmm. and 2021. And one of the things that, that we talked about was how hard it is to talk about new work um, as artists. It often feels really fresh and like we don't have that, that distance um, to talk about it. But I was wondering, you mentioned um, a real interest in the ordinary and the mundane. And I'm just going to share an, um, an image, a couple images from the work in the show, and maybe talk, if you could, um, about what interests you in that or in how you go about um, starting a new body of work like this. Um. <laughs> yeah, so that maybe that's kind of like maybe two separate questions. And first of all, let me stop and say thank you so much, everybody, for welcoming me into your home. Uh, I wish I was there to see the exhibition. And thank you so much, Molly, and the gallery assistants that have helped hang this show. Um, I feel very lucky to be so well taken care of, and I feel honored to. Um, show at your university, at your college, and thank you for the invite. Um, yeah, the mundane, I mean, that's where it's at. <laughs> and I feel like it, that's especially potent right now because like, what else do you have right now? You know, <laughs> uh, but I know. It seems like, um, and I think for our students too, that it can be like really hard to make something interesting out of something that's not interesting. You know, it, it, it often feels like work has to be about something really big. Universal big. Yeah, no, I, that trips me up too. Sometimes when my brain gets rolling and I'm like thinking a thousand things, like I get a really big artist block. Um, but I think that looking at the mundane and the everyday is a really nice, can be a really nice entryway into talking about universal things. I think it's, uh, that was something that I learned that was really helpful is just take a small bite, <laughs> you know, like just look where you are. And I often find myself, uh, it, in fact, even when I was in school and I was probably your student's age, I had another artist describe me as someone, they literally described me as someone, I picture you as someone that's always looking at the ground, you know, when you, <laughs> and so it is like, I'm always sort of like, um, I, I'm pretty ADD. And so like taking in the whole picture is often really overwhelming, like, uh, you know, like going to the grocery store and all that kind of stuff. So sometimes if I can just like channel like one little thing at a time, you know, uh, 
it is like I can focus on, oh, well, that's sort of this interesting, you know, thing. And then I take it elsewhere from that. Um, so these, per, you know, this, a lot of this work in the show that's up now at Ripham is um, sort of really inspired by, you know, it was made post COVID um, and everybody was going insane and needed to get out of the house. So the only thing you could do was I actually adopted a dog uh, right when everything was closing down. She's a little four-year-old, um, a little four-year-old brown pit bull and she needed a lot of exercise. So all my like exciting part of my day was to walk her like three times a day when every, you know, this is like right when everything was shut, you know, you're like all of a sudden trying to teach online out of nowhere and <laughs> everything like this. So I like walk the dog all the time. And um, we have these, I kind of live in a blighted area and it's not, it's cute, but there it's like touch and go and we have to cross railroad tracks and stuff. And there's always these like little, um, you know, stuff. I don't, where do they, are they throwing them out of the train? I don't know. No. There's like homeless people and things like that along the tracks. And then there's just stuff that's left. You know, and it's always this really interesting stuff that collects this kind of residue and history on it. And that's where a lot of these pieces in the exhibition sort of, I like this idea of this really interesting folded object that used to be a box of Triscuits or something that, um, you know, has been run over by a train and then snowed on or rained on and then full, you know, you know somebody tried to make something out of it. And then it's, you know, it becomes this really interesting object that, you know, collaborated with nature. <laughs> I had nothing to do with, you know, nobody had anything to do with it besides their everyday comings and goings, but it becomes this really interesting thing. That's really interesting because you have recently taken over teaching, um, heading the printmaking area yeah. at the mm -hmm. university. And so a lot of what you were just describing there about these objects, this detritus, um, this trash getting kind of imprinted by its environment strikes mm -hmm. me as really similar to yeah. what you're doing in the, in the print shop. So mm -hmm. um, that's a nice, a nice connection, but you, you know, those things are sort of happening in the environment, the, the universe, as it were, is doing those things to the, to the objects and you're yeah. observing. So observation, mm -hmm. walks, those types of things are really, it sounds like important to your practice and, and what maybe spurs some of the new work. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I just wanna encourage everyone, we're gonna keep it pretty casual tonight with a Q&A. I've got some images and I've got some questions, but um, please don't hesitate. If you have questions to type them into the chat um, as we go along so that we can, uh, we can hear what you are thinking about, which is probably more interesting. <laughs> what I've got going on. Um, so I pulled out some images here, Tracy, of a couple of your earlier pieces, um, in part to, to say, you know, your work is, is really diverse in terms of materials and media, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're making prints, you're making things that operate as books, you are making sculptures, ceramics. Um, how do you, do you, do you consciously think about like what is the best material or media for this piece or does that sort of happen more organically um, as you build? Uh, yeah, I think um, the, the, the content drives the material, but I also think I mean, that's like sort of a short nerdy answer, right? But I also think that I'm a super tactile person that I am like on the haptic scale of learning probably like 98%. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I learn physically. And so of course materials are important. Um, this is, a, that's a nice way to ask this question about these works because this was a, this is not too long ago. It's only a couple years ago. And it was a pivot from what I was doing. I think um, Molly's going to bring these works up next, which was a lot of ceramics. Um, and I just started really um, feeling the need to think about my materials in a more environmentally friendly way. Like I was really just getting crushed by all the, um, you know, no 
no good movement on conserving the environment and things like that. And um, I found these, well, so the ceramics were really freaking me out because um, I found that after I fired them, you know, they became this like hump of thing that I couldn't even take the parts apart and then reconstitute and make something else like I could wood even like I was making big wood sculpture before that. And so I think it was the ceramics that just got me. It was like at some point I had all these huge cause I make really big work and I make a lot of work and I had all these huge fired humps of things that really couldn't, I mean, I guess I could have pulverized them and made the, but it wasn't like really easy to take them apart and use the materials again, like recycle the materials. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> I don't know what it was. It was that and just kind of reading more um, environmental, you know, stuff that was going on in politics and things like that. It was, it was like a perfect storm. And um, I went to school at University of Arizona and I had my master's in printmaking and because it was Arizona, you know, there's very little groundwater and we, um, this was years ago, I'm old people, but this was years ago and back then we had a green print shop. I mean, we were learning green practices like what, I mean, 20 years, I mean, it was like 20 years ago as in grad school. And I, you know, flashback to Miami, I've been at Miami for 17 years and it, it was, it's all old, old school stuff that, you know, hasn't taken that in consideration. But I think in Arizona, they had to because of the water issue, you know, nothing could go into groundwater. And so it just sort of turned that stuff around. So this is like a really long, boring answer to your question. But <laughs> the um, piece on the left is, uh, I started, uh, both of these pieces are inspired by Boucherie rugs, which are um, rugs that are hand uh, made and woven from all recycled materials. And I kept on finding like the students would throw away all this really good paper in the trash can. And um, I would pull out the trash can, it would have like three charcoal marks on it or something and then they would throw it away. And I was, and so I kept on pulling it out cause I was like, well, I can do another drawing on top of this or something, you know? And um, so the paper rug drawings became the, I, I was really obsessed with the designs on these Boucherie rugs. And um, I just love the whole concept of them because they were based on like kind of traditional designs, except they would improvise. And um, so they just became these really quirky sort of abstract pieces, which I've been drawn through throughout my uh, art history research. And they are all out of recycled, you know, discarded parts and re discarded garments and recycled materials. So the piece on the left is actually recycled materials, fabric. And then I kind of started thinking about like, what would it be like to make a drawing about a rug? Like what does a, draw a drawing about a rug, which is kind of a semi two dimensional object, what does that look like? And so the piece on the right is made of recycled paper that I painted over and cut and tried to make these improvised rug drawings that hang on the wall, but have have like a relief part to them. That's great. I, I wasn't um, familiar with the Boucherie rugs, but when I looked at them, they, they reminded me of, of latch hook rugs. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but then they also reminded me of like just stacks of post-it notes and all of the sorts of mm -hmm. things to do and the, the paper that we accumulate and discard. So it seems mm -hmm. to fit kind of into, um, into what you were saying there. And students watch out um, what you discard um, <laughs> into artwork by someone else. So looks like we do have one question. Tracy, how do you determine the juxtapositions that you choose in your collages and assemblages? I see contrasts in material, texture, and color. What other decisions or choices are in play? So I really like um, this idea of, uh, of it. I like this idea of awkwardness or um, feeling it to me it represents feeling human or in like really feeling imperfections 
And uh, I think there's also sort of this sense of openness where you don't like totally complete an idea and you bring, you pull the viewer in, but I kind of like want to pull the viewer in by the gut. So um, I'm really inspired by uh, my students work sometimes. Um, like when I, I'm in printmaking now, but I used to teach freshmen a lot and um, they would often come in and just work on a piece so hard, like just love it so hard that it would fall apart in their hands because they gave it too much love. <laughs> and it was um, sort of this beautiful thing. It was like, it was very like, uh, it just, um, I don't know, like I'm probably reading too much into it, but it would always sort of, um, like I said, I'm very haptic learner. It would like always sort of give me this like body response and artists make work like this. That is very visceral you know, that like you can see the artist's hand and you can see the fury and the, you know, the want that th this thing they're trying to achieve. And sometimes it's not about per perfection, right? It's this communication of our human exist, our imperfect human existence, right? That, that, that's it. And so I think that's what I really tried to capture. Like I want someone to see the work and kind of have this response to like it's not quite finished it's not it's like a little awkward like I want that humanity to be really communicated uh, I don't know if that answered your question maybe you wanted a more formal response but the formal response Robert can type another question in if he wants a more formal response okay <laughs> he can try he can try his hand again um we don't have any other questions up so he could he could get to be the next one in the in the queue. Um, Tracy, you, <laughs> when, <laughs> when you sent the work, you were like, oh, you said something in an email, like, I'm just, you know, it's really new. It, it feels really weird or something to that effect. And I remember thinking, okay, okay. Well, I feel like all of your work is really weird and <laughs> <laughs> um, so this work just sort of, to me, fits, you know, sort of seamlessly in, but I, I understand what you're thinking. This work um, is really about the interaction between the body and the sculpture. Um, do you have anything that, that you want to say about this or where this comes from or what you were, were interested in with this body of work? Yeah, this is, so this work is pretty old. Um, I, I mean, not like ancient or anything, but um, it is like, a, this work got showed a lot. Um, yeah, I wanted to think about what it meant to be a, what it meant to be a sculpture, I guess. And, uh, I, you know, you just heard me do my little diatribe about this idea of this bodily response and how that human thing was really important. Um, I'm trying to think back like on a lot of the stuff, but I liked the fact that it was sort of performative and also a sculpture in itself, mm -hmm. um, that it had movement and it could change. I mean, a lot of the works at this point, when I was thinking about like the artist statement that kind of went along with these works, I was kind of thinking about this idea of, um, I really liked this idea of sort of lack and control control or fate like we tried to um tell ourselves or reassure ourselves a lot that we have everything under control and whatever not but the truth is is like any um pandemic or whatever can <laughs> just totally reroute the whole universe like that and i had a couple of those experiences when i was really young right before i went to college and i kind of think of these pieces almost like um you don't have the one up that I really think about like this, but um, that uh, they are sort of these growths on the body, right? And the body's made to carry and perform, yet uh, it's kind of like the way a river would um, make its, or a stream would make its way around a rock or something. Like eventually after many attempts at trying to crush it, crush it, crush it, it just sort of goes around it and changes the shape of the body. So I like to, the idea of these sculptures called sort of sculpt using the body as a sculpture material, you know? Yeah, and this is sort of, you know, these are examples of how often I think about interactivity in 
in art, either, mm -hmm. you know, being able to physically pick up and handle a book uh, at a museum, being able to insert my body into a sculpture, or maybe hear sound. And this is the way that that I think about and teach um, interactivity. And I wanted to show this work um, in part so that you could talk about um, how, how this work was influenced by thinking about um, interactivity and art in the universe sort of differently. Yeah, so I think these pieces um, came out of an exhibition that had a, a bunch of other sort of raw clay material and things like that. Um, I had just gone to India. I took I take students to India. I was teaching a class in um, India, and I also had myself gone to Nepal and um, uh, taught in China. And one of the things that really struck me was when I did that, um, I realized like our artwork and our Western culture is really contextualized in a much different way. Like you have to go into a museum. And you're in a, which, you know, I'm not against or anything. It, it kind of makes my work look really great. <laughs> like these clean white walls and, you know, like, because my work's a little crazy. So to be sort of broadcast in this clean light space works for it. But um, I just got really inspired by the fact, especially in India, where they would have these, you know, statues or shrines or things on the side of the road, like it would literally be on the side of a highway where someone just picked a little piece of fence and um, pinned up, you know, some decorations and left some rice for the cow to eat as an offering and then the cow would poop next to it. And it was like experiencing artwork or thing was an everyday part of your life. It wasn't like you had to enter into a museum and be prepared for this experience and be educated, right? It was just like, um, part of your daily would be like to go visit these three shrines or sculptures that you really liked on your way to work. You might have to take a side street or whatever. And sometimes you would bring some colored powder or you would bring a little offering, but it would, it, you would touch it. It was just there in the street, like important, like kind of pretty important, you know, sculptures and artworks were just like out and about. And I mean, I guess we have some of that in our Capitol buildings and you know, saint sculptures or things like that, but it, it just like they were, they were just so rubbed away and eroded. And like I was talking about, like just er animals and everything were interacting. It was in your face, yeah. you know, you didn't have to make a special visit. <laughs> yeah. So I have a few questions and, and actually two of them are really sort of similar. One, one person asks, how do you come up with these ideas? Um, <laughs> the other person asks, can you tell us a little bit about how you generate your ideas? You know, is it more yeah. analytical? Is it more intuitive? Um, it's definitely more intuitive. And, um, you know, I get stuck like everyone else. Like I, um, Molly and I were talking before this, like um, COVID, this whole shutdown of everything just totally... Uh, it, I know a lot of people were really productive during, I mean, ultimately I was at the end, but um, it was because I had to make stuff, different stuff than I was planning on for the show. And um, it really stopped me in my tracks. I mean, I just felt like I was, someone picked me up my ankles and turned me upside down. And I mean, I just had to re, I just had to have a moment and reevaluate everything that I thought might be important or not important. But on the daily, <laughs> if we talk about normal times, um, I I think it's really important to have a, con for me, it seems most beneficial to have a consistent practice because you don't, you're not always stopping and starting all the time. And do I always do that 100% seamlessly all the time? No, but I probably do it 90%. And um, I hate it when I don't do it because I have this, like, like you said, I have to think of this monumental idea all of a sudden, instead of just having this kind of stream of consciousness conversation with whatever is going on in my studio. Um, so I, um, that's how it works the best for me. And I try to facilitate that even if it's only, you know, like, okay, I skip a day here, a day there, you know, I have long teaching days on occasion, but, you know, I kind of try to get a lot of 
several hours and it doesn't have to be long periods of time. And I tried to just get in there and look at the work and write about it and talk about it or even work on my computer in the studio. So I'm kind of still looking at the work and things like that. Um, so we've got one question that kind of feeds off that a little bit, which is, yeah. do your collections usually, you know, begin with, with an idea or are you kind of making a, a piece or a body of work and then the next one sort of follows behind? Like is one thing building on the other? I think that's the easiest way to do it, but I don't actually start out with thinking them as collections. They come, they kind of come together like that, like midway in the process. Like I start and I have no idea what I'm doing or if it'll come out. Okay. I'm just like, I have to do, you know, it is very intuitive. Like I have this, it feels like a conversation, like a back and forth with like, I want to do this. And then the artwork sort of pushes back and resists. And then I, you know, kind of, it's, it just feels, feels that way, like a conversation with whatever's going on. Like I don't have ultimate, I mean, at the end I have ultimate control, but when I'm trying to develop, it feels like, ah. <laughs> and uh, so, um, what, what was the question again? I'm sorry, I don't feel like I answered it. No, 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 you did. Cause actually I'm gonna go back to, um, I'm gonna go back to sharing something cause I wanna, um, and I'm gonna flip ahead here. Sorry guys, I'll go right back to it. but. Um, these, these, the series that you have in the gallery seem like ones that kind of fed off of each other. So I, correct me if I'm wrong, Tracy, but on the left, I've got one from a series titled Overspray. Mm -hmm. And then on the right, I've got these discard paintings. And as I look at the, um, it looks like latch hook mesh to me. But as mm -hmm. I look at that mesh, it seems to correspond with the spray painting. So it seems like one was part of the process of the other and then became its own thing. This is this crazy thing. I, I cannot, I mean, this will be something I can't necessarily uh, verbal, you know, articulate to you tonight, but this is a crazy thing I've been doing for a while. I don't know what this is about, but it seems important. But I want one artwork to generate for whatever reason, I sort of am like really hungry about this cycle that one, the trash of one artwork generates the next series <laughs> of the other artwork. And so what I did was I, again, found paper. Some student discarded this notebook of um, papers, these size this kind of canvas paper. And I needed to spray paint to start the discard series, the painting series. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to spray paint and it's going to make, I, I sort of knew it was going to make some cool marks and I wanted to put something underneath to protect the floor anyway. So I just put out all these papers underneath and I'm like focused on these canvas pieces, the discard pieces, but I just let the paper collect the whatever happened when I'm working on these canvas pieces. And so I had a bunch of these papers then after I spray painted, did different stuff that had really interesting markings that I then went back into to generate little draw, like the next generation little drawings that were based on the off spray from these, the, the discard pieces. Well, I mean, I don't think that sounds crazy because I do something similar myself. So, I mean, maybe we're just both um, <laughs> a, little, a little nuts there. Um, we're sort of running out of time and I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw you a couple questions and you just maybe answer whatever one you want or, or both. Um, a student is asking about color in your work and mm -hmm. asks if you could speak about the importance of color and color theory um, in your work. And another person is asking, um, you know, about found materials in work and kind of, you know, how that plays in and what the importance of found materials um, is in your work, so. Those are both really good questions. I'm just gonna try to be fast and do both, is that okay? I mean, people could, yeah. We're, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, um, color is so important. I feel like color is its own language in itself. And I often think of non-color, like I, I'm just so like, vibrated by color it's really hard for me to not just dive in I have I I do teach color theory I do love color theory but I think um, color theory 
is a thing that teaches you how to mix colors and what happens when you mix this and this, but there's also this life of color that's like symbolic or referential that really holds a lot of content or experience, like think of the colors from the 80s and you guys are too young, but the 80s have revi were revived like last couple of years ago when we all used to wear clothes that weren't sweatpants. Um, so <laughs> that's, I, that's I, I mean, I it's just the color is just so, it holds so much content and it speaks volumes. And especially when you tend to be an abstract, you know, work in an abstract way, like I do, I think you can hit a nerve there you know, by really, and I love fashion. Um, I don't watch too, too much TV, but I think, you know, also fashion really uses color and texture in that way too, to kind of strike yeah. a vibe that yeah. carries interesting we've got, content. We've got great color and texture um, on you and behind you. Um, I know, I'm, so. I'm matching. <laughs> yeah, you're sort of becoming, um, becoming <laughs> your artwork, which um, is not um, unlike, you know, some of your work. So um, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get to all the things we were gonna kind of okay. talk about. I'll just, I'll just- I wanna talk about the found one though, really quick. Or do you wanna oh, talk about Oh yeah, this? yeah, no, no, no. Talk about the found one, yep. Let's get out of here. The found is, um, so I think the found sort of links to the color thing. Like it's a really good way to bring meaning into the work, but it also can sometimes if you use it, like it can be overused and become a crutch where you can't find your own voice, right? So you're, you're finding these objects that are totally loaded with all this meaning and you are the arranger, right? You're the orchestrator of all this. But um, I think it's always fun to recontextualize. Um, I think the found object certainly, you know, has a really strong voice, but I, I guess um, trying to control that or insert your language along with it is important. And that goes with color too. I think those two questions were kind of related. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought too. And the other thing, um, I just wanted to say is, you know, you're using some found objects, but you're also, really heavily manipulating some of those yeah. found and scavenged objects. So um, I guess my last question is, has a student ever noticed um, you reappropriating uh, their discards? Has anyone ever <laughs> no, that? nobody said anything. That's, 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 <laughs> hey, I started that. Yeah. <laughs> Not so much. Nobody said anything yet, but hey, I could get called out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, Tracy, thank you so much. This is, um, I hope it's been entertaining for everyone else. It's been oh. really, um, fun and engaging for me to, to talk to you tonight. I just want to thank everybody who is joining us live um, and for those of you watching the recordings. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. If you, if you want to stay on for another few seconds, feel, feel okay. Free.